Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I'm your host, J.P. John Paz. With me today, very special guest, former WCW superstar. He is an actor, stuntman, martial artist, of course, does the most importantly, a pro wrestler and a pro wrestling coach and trainer. He is, of course, Glacier from WCW, a.k.a. Mr. Ray Lloyd. Ray, welcome to the two-man power trip. How are you doing? Ah, oh, John, thank you very much, man. I'm glad we finally got together to be able to do this. I know we've been trying to been get our schedules together for quite a while. <laughs> What's going on in your world? I know you're extremely busy. What's up? Yeah, yeah. I'm actually right now. I'm actually here at uh, uh, where the Power Factory is located. Excuse me, Power Factory. It's our old name, but uh, the uh, the Nightmare Factory. So, uh, but uh, um, uh, I'm here in Atlanta, Georgia, Norcross, Georgia, to be more specific, which is where the Nightmare Factory is located. And it's located within um, the uh, a huge athletic training complex, about thirty five thousand square feet complex called Chip Smith Performance Systems, and. Um, and Chip actually is one of my mentors, one of my best friends. Uh, I met him when I was about 15, 16 years old, and uh, he's one of the top sports performance trainers in the world. And um, so to be a part of uh, it, be located within his facility just gives us so much credibility, too. And, uh, and the fact that our trainees here get to see other world class athletes uh, training here and they get to see their work ethic and their work habits and and, um, you know, and their, their positive attitude, things like that. So. Uh, so, yeah, it's 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 a great. Uh, environment where I think uh, we bring a lot to the table here as well, but uh, but it's it's a great environment for our trainees to be able to uh, to just soak up uh, what it what it really means to uh, to do the work. You know, as, as Cody likes to say and DDP likes to say, it's you know uh, just so Paige just put out a uh, he puts out kind of these daily short videos, and I think the one yesterday was you know it's uh, one of, you know the will to win is great, but the the will to prepare to win is what most people don't uh, don't. Don't uh, execute, which is getting out there and doing the work. And so, so uh, I'm up here for uh, uh, I'm like a two weeks at a time now. I was here just this week, and I'll be here next week. And and yeah, we definitely make sure they do the work <laughs> so they can earn their stripes. Now, how long have you been like with Cody and the Nightmare Factor, or really the the Power Factor? How long have you been training like at that facility? Um, we actually uh, QT and I actually started this together. Um, uh, QT called me, let's see, and of course I've known Cody uh, for, for a long, long time uh, because of uh, my relationship with Dusty and, and, and then the whole family, you know, and, uh, but, um, uh, but QT contacted, contacted me, I believe it was in 2016 and, uh, and we decided to partner together and, um, uh, and we, of course, you know, at first it was called the Power Factory, One Fall Power Factory, which we took, uh, he came uh, from the Monster Factory, I came from Power Factory and WCW, so we came up with the name Power Factory, and, um, <clears throat> and, and we moved here, I think we were open um, uh, maybe less than a year, maybe, and then we took, when we moved here to, uh, to Chip's place, and I think it was late um, Late 2016 or 17. My the years run together when you get older, John. Oh yeah, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, and of course we we kept that name and we really built it up. And I give I give QT so much credit in the beginning because uh, uh, anybody that knows QT, uh, uh, him and his wife Carolyn, just just awesome awesome people. Um, and uh, I mean he really was because uh, I was in Orlando a lot coming back and forth, uh, but he was here full time. They had moved from Orlando here, and and he was really the workhorse that really. Um, did so much of the work in the beginning to to get everything established, get it set up. Uh, every bit of money that was made, he poured right back into the school to to buy equipment and and, and additional rings and uh, you know more canvases, everything uh, to make it a uh, first class facility. And then um, about two years ago, I believe it, maybe a little over two years ago, uh, was when um, uh, Cody came on board and we re basically rebranded. You know, as a Nightmare Factory, and um, and and that's what we've been ever since. And uh, and I still live in Orlando, but I, I like I said, I come back up as much as I can. We typically do um, uh, camps twelve weeks at a time. Right now, we're just finishing up. Uh, we typically train Monday through Thursday, so we just finished week six of our seventh camp. So um, we've had some success with the camps there, um, and, and typically we have around twenty or so uh, trainees for each camp, uh, give or take a little bit, but, uh, uh, and it's just a great chance. It's a great chance for, um, uh, you know, for, for us to be able to share what we know and hopefully uh, impart uh, some wisdom and, and, and teach the next generation the right way to do it. And uh, you know, with our, our business, um, uh, sometimes uh, because there is no real barrier to entry in professional wrestling, there's a lot of people, unfortunately, who don't get trained properly. And uh, and sometimes they don't really realize maybe that they're not getting training, pro getting trained properly. I, I always like to say you don't know what you don't know. If you if you go to train in pro wrestling and, and you get trained by someone who doesn't really know what they're doing, which happens a lot in our business, unfortunately, uh, you know, by the time you get out there, you, you don't realize that that you're doing it wrong. So uh, that's our big thing is during the 12 weeks is really, really hammer home the fundamentals. 
you know, really the, the, the you know, because it's, you know, the, the old saying will always hold true that you have to learn to crawl before you walk and you got to learn to walk before you run, you know? So, uh, so we really, um, and we all really enjoy it. Uh, like, uh, of course, unfortunately, because of Cody's injury, you know, he's uh, not on the road as much as he would like to be right now, obviously, but he's, he's rehabbing and getting, getting well. And, um, you know, and, and so uh, he, he comes, you know, as much as he can with us, even with his schedule now, even though he's not on the road, he's still a very busy guy. Uh, and QT gets here obviously as much as he can too. Typically on Mondays is a good day where we're hopefully, you know, we typically all try to be here. And then based on how their schedules are the rest of the week, they're uh, they, they get here as quick as much as they can too. But, but yeah, it's a great environment. Um, it's something, and I truly love. I got you know my master's in education. I was a school teacher for several years, some before WCW, some after WCW. But uh, yeah, it's um, it's something that's a true passion of mine, and uh, uh, I, and I like to be able to to just you know I always tell all the trainees that literally everything that I'm telling them is not anything that I came up with or I thought of. It's stuff that was taught to me and taught to me by people that I trusted, and I feel a moral obligation to the the legacy of those those people to pass along what what uh what i learned and uh hopefully the people that are coming through our our camps that train here and that and that, that, that wear our brand and, and earn their stripes through us will will continue to pass that along to the next generation obviously you got a great relationship with cody because you're out there at all in right a part of his yeah, uh, yeah. his team so i mean obviously you got a great relationship uh, with cody yeah that you know what that was a that was a really really big night very special night for a lot of reasons and uh you know when when he asked uh, uh ddp and i to um to 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 be there in his inner circle so to speak to to walk with him to the ring um yeah it, it really was i mean it was um it was a moment that that is, is one of the most special moments in my entire career it really was just to kind of be there and soaking all that up and really you know seeing cody you know um grow from you know a, a teenager you know when he was at Laster high school which i went back to teach at Laster after my wcw years um one of my very best friends is coach steve day who was Cody's wrestling coach who coached him to two state titles. As a matter of fact, I'm meeting up for lunch with Coach Day tomorrow. So, but, uh, but, um, but yeah, but you know, just to see him grow uh, into the, the 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 person, the man that he has become, it's just been it's been a real pleasure to see. It really has, and uh, uh, and I'm 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 very very proud of him. I'm very proud to be associated with him on the level that we're on now, uh, and. Um, you know, and just and and to see where he takes us. You know, I'm excited to see where the, what the future holds for him. Um, you know, I feel like uh, I personally feel like, you know, he's the he's the man from here on out uh, as far as, uh, you know, the face of WWE. I mean, I feel like he he is going to be the uh, the next, you know, guy at the top of the mountain, so to speak. I really believe that. I mean, I, I know his work ethic. Uh, I know his commitment to to the wrestling business um, and I know his, his passion, his focus. I mean, he's just uh, um, he's he's. He's a very, very hardworking. I mean, he, you know, he, we always say do, do the work, which is kind of like one of his his phrases. And um, and and he uh, he walks the walk. He he does the work. It's funny, like with the him, like it's really the relationship with Dusty that kind of led you to him, right? Like it's oh, sure, it's just yeah. the, the history of it all, really. Yeah, and I and I grew up in Brunswick, Georgia, which is about an hour. Uh, north, right on the Georgia, Florida line of Jacksonville, Florida. And so back in the three channel days when me and my twin brother were growing up, you know, we were fortunate enough, even with the, uh, you know, the tinfoil on the antenna there, we could still get Georgia Championship Wrestling and Championship Wrestling from Florida. And Dusty, uh, during that era, was mostly in Florida, but he would float back and forth to Georgia some as well, but mostly Florida. <clears throat> so we went, uh, you know, my dad would take us. And, and, and as I got older as a teenager, me and my my teenage buddies and my brother, we would go to the Jacksonville Coliseum to watch wrestling. And of course, um, you know, Dusty, I've said many, many times over the years, I mean, my, I, I was very fortunate to come from, uh, uh, you know, two great, I came a family, we had two, I had two great loving parents uh, who were great role models. And they were, they're always been my, they've been my first heroes, obviously. Um, and we, uh, that being said, you know, we, we, we didn't have a whole lot growing up, uh, but, but we had a lot of love in our family, you know, and my dad was a huge wrestling fan. And so, um, so, you know, it's like, like any kid, like if your dad likes it, okay, well, Hey, I'm probably going to like it too, just so I can hang out with dad. And so that's how we were. And, and my my dad, um, you know, uh, watched wrestling with us. And, and so, um, and, and my, growing up, my two childhood heroes outside of my parents were literally were Dusty Rhodes and Evil Knievel. Those were my two childhood heroes. Nice. And if you're a child of the seventies, you know, you, you all know how, how cool Evil Knievel was across, you know, internationally. And to me, because growing up in the South Georgia right there, 
I thought, you know, even though I, Dusty was a huge international star, you know, I, I assumed that the whole wrestling world happened right there in Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> you know, right. was, to me, that's, that's where the wrestling world was. And, um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, and, and, and so we're going to WCW in, in January of 96 and being there for literally the last five years of, of, of its existence, really up until the very end. Um, I, I was still, I was very intimidated, even though I had a chance to work really in the same company with Dusty in the beginning. You know, I didn't really talk to him a lot. I didn't, I was just, you know, it's like, you know, you know, he was, you know, he's very, uh, and I mean this in a great way, but I mean, it's just like, you know, he was larger than life to me. So it was very intimidating for me to try to go up and get to know him at first. And, um, and, uh, and, but one, eventually once I did, uh, you know, we, we struck up a great friendship and, uh, and it was one that became very, very important to me. Uh, and when he, he left in 2000, um, at 2000, when he left WCW and started the Turnbuckle Championship Wrestling, uh, you know, it, it, he, um, I remember him, him calling me up and, and literally, you know, asking me to, to come on board and, and kind of be his right hand guy and kind of help him really get this thing going and just have someone there that he could basically delegate a lot of stuff to kind of like his assistant or whatever you want to call it, uh, which I was very proud to do, obviously, you know, and, uh, and so even though I was working with WCW, uh, he, he set up offices right there in Marietta, Georgia, and, um, you know, and, and, and it was where I could, you know, when I was off of the road, uh, literally every other minute I spent just doing whatever I could to help CCW and, and help Dusty build that. And uh, and then, you know, a year later, uh, April of 01, when, when WCW was uh, acquired by WWE, uh, I, my, like I said, my buddy Steve Day was the department head at Laster High School. And, um, and just fortunately, over that summer, they had a position come open in the PE department. And, of course, he was the one who would basically be the one who would be hiring um, and or at least recommending to the principal who to hire. And so he called me up and said, hey, I got a position coming open if you want to come back to, to Laster. And of course, I jumped on it. And so what it allowed me to do was was uh, to teach school. Uh, and I still was coaching. I coached football and, and actually ended up coaching lacrosse and um, and then work with Dusty to, to build TCW, which was which was really, really awesome for me, because uh, that's where our friendship uh, and the relationship really strengthened. Uh, to the point of of where you know it's 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 a lot of my best memories of Dusty were spent during that time. Very cool, like uh, you know to kind of be Dusty's right hand man and work with him. I mean that oh, that's yeah. awesome. That's got to be experience in and of itself. Oh, it, well, you know what? And, and and just to be clear, there were there was a great team of, of of guys and girls that that Dusty brought together. So I would by by no means was was certainly the only one that was was helping build TCW. But but yeah, I, I kind of became um, you know it's funny like he, he would always call me kind of like his lieutenant, you know, which uh, which once again when you see your childhood hero giving you a title like that, you know. Even if it were in just title only, I mean, it was just or in name only, you know, it was just it was really cool and to be able to travel with him uh, and and get to the um, the arenas and really, you know, a lot of time for the most part, he put me in charge of running the locker rooms and and making sure everybody knew where their jobs and you know what the card was and who was in what order and just all that stuff that that you know somebody has to do to know that he he trusted me with that was uh, was an honor beyond words. It really, really was and. Uh, and, you know, just um, and I got I got to work with him a lot in the ring. I got to tag team with him, uh, you know, just um, once again, it was it, it I was really and this was all after WCW. And, and of course, WCW was an amazing experience for me. But but to and, and I look back now and like I said, my buddy, uh, uh, Luther Biggs, who came through the power plant, uh, WCW power plant. That's where we met. Uh, and he came into to TCW along with Big Ron Reese, Scotty Riggs. Um, you know, a lot of the, the WCW talent, uh, Daphne, uh, she was with us. And, and, and so, um, you know, we always talk about the fact that, you know, that uh, that we look back now and like having that to transition to right after WCW, um, I think really, really helped us kind of adjust back to kind of the real world. Because when, when we're in WCW, you're doing that full time. I mean, it is a world unlike anything else. But, you know, where it was at that time, because you're doing over 200 shows a year, you're gone all the time. It's a whirlwind the whole time. And um, and I don't know how I would have adjusted if if that wouldn't have been there. And I would just, just had to go back to just teaching school, which and I don't mean just teaching school as to take that light, because that you know, that's something that was really important to me as well. But but to not have if not have that transition to go right to where Dusty had with Turnbuckle and and had that camaraderie, had that that support group, so to speak. And and one, just having Dusty as like our head coach. I mean, he was the leader of the pack, you know, and it was, you know, it was Dusty. So it was 
and, and getting to know him and everyone else getting to know him on more of a personal level and seeing his dedication uh, to the, to the wrestling industry, seeing his love and his passion for it. Um, and, you know, and just to see the, uh, the people who wanted to come in and, 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 and work even just maybe one show at a time, the legendary names, just because it was, it was Dusty's promotion. It was a really, really uh, exciting time. And, and, and I, we look back now, we talk about it all the time, how having that transition from, from WCW to that, it really helped us kind of adjust back to, to the normal world. <laughs> yeah, really. Right. Yeah. Now you mentioned January of 96 WCW. How do you get into WCW? How, like who approaches you and how did you get signed and who ends up officially signing you to WCW? Uh, well, I'll tell you what, John, I mean, I, I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of great teachers and coaches throughout my entire life ever since, you know, starting with my parents. But, uh, uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm as a coach, you know, I, and a teacher, one of the things I love is, is, you know, I love, quotes because to me quotes help me remember the lessons you know and uh and i've learned a lot of great lessons over the years that that, that, I, that I repeat through quotes and but my all-time number one favorite quote is because everybody's heard the the quote you know it's not what you know it's who you know well um one of my college coaches who i really looked up to um was my college athletic trainer who rehabbed me back from several injuries uh, he said to me one time he said well i think there's another part of that that makes it even more true and i said well what is that and he said it's not what you know it's not who you know it's who's willing to say they know you and mm. who's willing to put their name and reputation on the line right. to give right. you an opportunity to give you a leg up, so to speak. And, um, and it literally, it was like, an, it was most, most eye opening thing I'd ever heard at, at that point in my life. And it, and it, I think it's still to this day, one of the most eye opening things when I, when I say it to people, cause they go, Oh wow. It's, cause it really, you think about it. I can go say, I know whoever that's in a position of, of influence. But if, I, if that person doesn't say they know me, that, my, you know, if I'm trying to get a leg up to, to whatever in whatever industry, it's not going to carry much weight unless that person also, you know, says the same yes. thing. So, yep. um, I, I, you know, I broke in in April of 87, uh, right uh, before I graduated college. And, uh, uh, the two gentlemen who really, really changed my life was, uh, my, my friend Rick Allen from Jacksonville, Florida, who wrestled at Sunny Beach for several years for WWF. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and, and Rick, uh, introduced me to, to Fred Avery and Fred was a, um, uh, great independent wrestler uh, from, from Georgia. He was from Warner Robins. He'd moved to Valdosta, him and his wife. And um, and they taped a little TV show right there in Valdosta. I got to know Fred through that. Um, Fred was a big old burly guy. And we're still great friends to this day. I'm with both of them, man. I am. And, um, and you know, Fred, uh, one of my best friends and that I was playing ball with at the time, his name was R.D. Swain. I played center. He played right guard. And, um, you know, it's a, the uh, the local newspaper did an article about uh, interviewed all the seniors and basically like what we were going to do after football. And and I was very fortunate to to go to Valdosta State and I was football scholarship and play for the first really first five seasons. I registered the first due to an injury. And um, uh, it's you know once again some of the greatest years of my life. Uh, I, I I text every day with one of my former teammates who sends me uh, you know inspirational quotes every 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 morning text me one which uh, keeps me going at times it really does but uh but anyway we we uh he invited we, we talked about what we're gonna do after wrestling after graduation excuse me and um we jokingly very jokingly said john that we were going to get into wrestling and become the tag team champions of the world and wow. uh and so fred and, and and rick they came to us and fred was like are you guys serious about getting into being you know tag team in wrestling and i was like Heck no, I'm not, man. I can't do that. I'm not tough enough to do that. You know, because right. this obviously was pre-internet days where the business was still very, very protected. And um, and because of that, I still really protect the business because I do believe that 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 fans still, you know, believe in the magic of professional wrestling and, and the magic that we create. Uh, but uh, but um, uh, and that's one of the things. Okay, you may know that you may know that it, that we are creating magic. You may know that it's not a true Simon pure sport, so to speak. But I don't doesn't have to tell you how we do the magic, you know, or how we create it, you know. But um, but um, but Fred really, I mean, he really convinced me because I really, I, I think back now, like I didn't really think I could do it. I really what didn't know. I was like, I just, you know, even though I played college football and I was a martial artist and all that, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if it was, you know, if I was cut out for that. And he was like, I promise you, you can do this. And and um, so I thank Fred all the time to this day. I was up visiting Rick and his wife, my, my girlfriend and I just uh, a few months ago up in uh, Long Island. And, and I just thanked him over and over the whole weekend. Like, because if they wouldn't have believed in me and really pushed me to, to train, I, I'm sure I wouldn't have done it on my own. And I don't know where my my career is, I, I mean, I would have probably never gotten into wrestling. So, um, it's, I just, that's why I always, I feel it's a very important thing to believe in people and let them know you believe in them because they put me on a path that changed the whole rest of my life. And, uh, but, um, but yeah, so I trained, we trained there, uh, 
for about five months. And then, uh, and then we back the way it used to be. Then you, you got kind of thrown out into the territory system and you were put with veteran wrestlers and, and they brought you along. And we were very fortunate to, uh, to be put into some groups where we had really true, really good veteran wrestlers who really brought us along. Um, there was uh, Ben Masters, who's uh, still a great friend of mine, uh, still a promoter. He promoted what's called Pete State Wrestling back in the day. And we worked a lot, and there was guys like uh, Ted Oates, uh, of course, uh, Bob Armstrong, Mr. Wrestling Number Two, guys of that caliber who book, Ben always booked that really brought us along. And so uh, and then uh, fast forward to 1990, I got to the point where I was like, you know what? They're not going to come to Valdez and find us. Like, we have to go to them. And, and my goal was to go to WCW just because just because I grew up in Georgia, and, and to me, that was that was the wrestling world. Even though I, I was watching WWF as well, um, you know, that just appealed more to me because of uh, my roots, I guess you would say, in, in wrestling so um i moved to atlanta i got a teaching job in marietta georgia i taught was teaching middle school wrestling on the weekends during the summer breaks during the holidays it was a great schedule to to support a wrestling you know uh you know dream at that time and uh and so uh not the smartest guy in the world john but i was smart enough to immediately join main event fitness which lex and sting owned right there Marietta, where all the wrestlers yep. trained and um and through that you know disco inferno was a good friend of mine scotty riggs bagwell we we all kind of came up together you know and um uh, and through them, uh, and I, I believe it's through Disco, I got to meet um, uh, Dallas, and Dallas and I became really good friends. And um, and so, uh, you know, Dallas really did. I mean, he saw my work ethic, he saw my attitude, he saw my commitment. Uh, and so he pitched a couple of times. Actually, believe it or not, he actually, um, Disco helped me come up with the Coach Buzz Stern gimmick. And um, <laughs> and Dallas actually pitched the Coach Buzz Stern gimmick uh, at one of his Christmas parties to Bischoff, um, maybe, uh, maybe a couple years before the, the, the whole glacier thing happened and uh and he was like he was kind of uh, lukewarm on it. he's like ah okay yeah maybe yeah but yeah, it obviously never never really got off, off the ground went anywhere but uh um but dallas had been but so dallas tonight was december 23rd 1995 you talk about certain days that stick in that change your your world um and we were in lennox mall here in atlanta uh christmas shopping and we stopped to eat at the food court at the california pizza kitchen and we were eating and I said to Dallas, I said, I said, you know, Dallas, I said, uh, you know, I'm thinking about putting some martial arts into what I do in the ring. I said, I, I, maybe maybe that'll just give me a little bit more, uh, you know, punch and, you know, pizzazz in the ring as far as what I'm doing. And he's, you know, he's eating a slice of pizza, you know, um, back before, you know, he, you know, he was, he, 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 he's all organic and everything. Now I'm, I'm sure we weren't eating organic pizza at that time, but, uh, but um, he just, you know, I'll never forget him saying, he goes, he goes, well, bro, he goes, well, it'd be great if you knew some of that stuff, but. If you know how Paige, Paige didn't say stuff. He said another word. It begins with right. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so I said, what do you mean? I said, I, I know I said, I, and I realized at that time I really, cause I was just kind of brought up by my two instructors that you don't really advertise that you, you, you know, because it's, my, my instructors had a great philosophy. You know, if you put an ad out there that you do all this stuff, sooner or later, somebody's going to answer the ad, you know? So my thing was always the fewer people that knew I studied martial arts, the better, you know? And, um, and so, when I, I just realized that Dallas, I really had not talked to him about that a lot. So he said, we know Bischoff's into all that stuff. And that's why I had no idea. And so I get, you know, here we are, we're walking around Christmas shopping. I give him all this information. He says, let me, let me give that to Bischoff and, 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 uh, you know, we'll see what happens. So, and at that time I had no idea at that time, but of course, you know, the wheels had already, the, you know, fundamental wheels, I guess had been put into play because of the popularity of Mortal Kombat. Um, you know, TBS had, had, um, I can't remember if the TV deal was already in place where they were doing the TV show Mortal Kombat. The TBS was was airing on TBS, but I just know that it was all obviously uh, there was some talk that that's kind of what they wanted to do was bring it into wrestling. And so, um, so you know, from what I understand from Dallas Bishop, I was like, well, let's get through the holidays, and you know, I want to meet with him after the holidays. So it was the first week in January, and um, Dallas calls me up, and says, hey, you know, uh, there's this steakhouse, like a Longhorn Steakhouse or something, like like um, right in our neighborhood, right outside our neighborhood. You know, be there at seven o'clock on whatever night it was, you know, I forget what night obviously, but, uh, but I walk in and, and Eric's sitting at the back of the restaurant, you know, kind of by himself, you know, just very casual. I walk back there, we sat down. Uh, and the long and short of it is, you know, that I, I remember the, it was a very long dinner because we talked and we talked and we talked. And, uh, um, I, I always, I'd remember like it was about a three, a whole three hour window of time by the time I finally got back in my car and left. But, uh, but, um, uh, we talked and, 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 you know, eventually, you know, whatever 
came of that conversation, there was enough there for him to say, hey, you know, um, yeah, I want to move forward with this. I want to sign you to WCW. And literally right there in that, that dinner meeting. And um, uh, and at the time, I had stepped away from teaching. I was working with Chip, uh, who I'm, I'm back and connecting now with. I was working with him. We were uh, at the Atlanta Athletic Club, which is really, really prestigious uh, country club here in Atlanta. And, and he was the athletic director, and he brought me on as a fitness director. So I had a really good job at the time, at, you know, um, and with a lot of prestige with that job. And, and uh, so – I, obviously wrestling was my dream, but still it was like, you know, I, it, it needed to be a, you know, certain good deal for me to walk away from that, you know? And, um, uh, but obviously I was excited. And I remember him saying like, I want to pay you to disappear from the independent wrestling scene. And you have to remember this was 96, January 96. This was very much the infancy of the internet, you know? And so uh, he goes, and as soon as he said that, I said, I can do that. And he said, I want you to cancel all of your independent bookings. Just disappear. Don't tell anybody why just, lay low, just disappear. He said, I don't, you don't even have to, you know, leave your job for right now. Just disappear. Just stop talking about wrestling. Stop, stop just, I don't want you to be on the radar at all in the wrestling world. And, and I did that. And, um, and then we, we brought on AFX studios, which uh, I recommended to, to Eric, um, because I'd worked with Andre Fritas before, who was, uh, who was a really talented, uh, special effects, uh, uh, artist. And so he got hired to, to contract to, to bring on, um, to be the one to create, uh, all four of the first, personas you know which was which would become glacier and mortis and of course ernest miller and wrath and so uh so yeah that's kind of how it started that's why i always tell all of our trainees and when i do seminars just say you never really know how your break's going to come or when it's going to come but your goal is to do it as i've learned from chip concentrate on what you can control and get all of those things in order and hopefully the break will come and if the break comes understand that the break may not last a long time but but it may but you may not know how the break may come. And I always use myself as an example. I said, you know, how many of you ever thought that I envisioned, you know, walking to the ring with armor and a blue mask on? Not once did I ever envision that being in right. a break. Right, absolutely, yeah. So, you know, yeah. but that's how, um, and I know it was kind of a long explanation, but yeah, that's really how it started. And uh, and there was a lot of a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure. And, uh, but once again, I go back to saying that, um, you know, like with anyone in wrestling, I mean, there's people that are fans of the the whole blood runs cold thing, and 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 the overall majority of people that I've talked to over the years were fans of it, or at least enjoyed it. There's some people who who didn't enjoy it, who were big critics of it, and I get it. And and it's one of the biggest lessons I teach too that if you think you're gonna, if your goal is to have any amount of success in this industry, there's gonna be critics. You better get t- you know thick skin because there's gonna be people that. Take take really really hard jabs at you, and it's hard not to take them personal. But <laughs> so, so get ready. But uh, but I, I you know I learned a long time ago, um, you know that uh, to how to to deal with that. But I had to go through it too. You know I had to go through dealing with the critics, and um, and there's still critics today. And I get it. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. You know that's what's uh, great about this world is. You know, it, but it doesn't mean I have to give it valid. You know I don't have to validate that opinion. But um, but you have an offer. You certainly have a right to express your opinion. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's funny. It's like, okay, you got Andre Fritas, you got Bischoff, everybody's kind of on board, but where does Glacier like come from? Where's the character come from? Is it literally like, okay, we want a sub zero Mortal Kombat guy, but we got to, you know, like, is that just basically the, the gist of it? Yeah. Well, what, um, what happened was, is, um, you know, we started meeting with Andre and, and of course, Eric and, and, and DDP was kind of put in charge of kind of, of kind of overseeing it and reporting to Eric, you know, and, and, and really we all were, but, um, but, uh, and I, and I, I, once again, you know, um, people may think whatever they want to think about, uh, Bischoff, but, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I, I, I have, you know, tons of respect for Eric. I mean, he, he gave me the opportunity that changed my life and, uh, and Eric and I, I mean, we don't, we don't cross paths that often, uh, but when we do, it's always, you know, it's, it's always, you know, very cordial. Um, and, uh, and I enjoy, I enjoy running into him. And I, I know through his 83 weeks podcast, he's, he's spoken pretty, pretty well about the whole gimmick and, and, and really defended a lot of what we did, which, uh, which I'm, I'm really happy to hear. But, um, but no, yeah, we started and so it was more like we we were because it wasn't a, a creative team at that, that back then. We really just had a booking committee, and and I will tell you, um, we really didn't get any help from from the office or anything. Which is not, I'm not saying that we should have or shouldn't have. It was just that we um, we were basically told, hey, you know, you guys are the team. I need you guys to to c- come up with ideas and, and get back with me, you know, uh, from from Eric. And um, and so what happened was uh, we started brainstorming we get together every day and we'd be brainstorming that's where i got to, to know chris canyon and become great friends with chris canyon and um and just for the record you know he became you know we all had a very tight-knit group that we um 
we used to call the FOP, the Friends of Page, you know, because Page is always, all of us had, you know, Page had kind of gone to bat for all of us at one point or another. And so um, uh, we became great friends. We spent a lot of time together, me, him, Brian Clark, and, and eventually Ernest, when Ernest came on board. And, um, and, and we just brainstorm day after day after day and uh when we started like um you know we just were like okay like uh who who should these these first two personas be and and, and i like to say persona because or gimmicks because you know it, when you say character i know character is an easy word to use but the way i look at it is like you know actors play characters you know and when you meet the actor you meet the actor you don't meet the character like if you meet tom cruise you don't meet maverick you meet tom cruise but when yeah. wrestling fans meet us then you know if a wrestling if i meet someone in the airport or wherever you know at this point they 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 expect to meet Glacier if they're a wrestling fan. They don't really care much about meeting Ray Lloyd. I don't. I don't think you know. And so because Ray Lloyd's pretty boring compared to Glacier, you know. So but um, yeah. but uh, but you know. So we started with okay. I was like okay. What what uh, who. Who do I relate most to? And it was just happened to be Sub Zero because I, you know, my my favorite color has always been blue. So my high school colors are blue and gold. You know, so it's just one of those things where blue and silver and black kind of like, okay, I want those to be my colors. And then Canyon was like, hey, you know, I like the green and and you know and the serpent character and all that stuff. So that's where it started. And and uh, and then um, I give Andre a lot of credit. He took tons and tons of notes. We started off with Glacier. It was up over about 150 names to start with. And we Whoa. just kept whittling it down, whittling it down, whittling it down. And eventually we got to like the final 10 names. And then and the funny story is, is that um, that uh, when we got down to like the final few. Uh, you know, we, we kind of band together to kind of uh, campaign to Eric for Glacier, because uh, if I remember correctly, like Eric was really sold on cryonic. Like he he kind of thought the name should be cryonic, you know. And um, and so we, we made our final pitch to him. We we're like, OK, here's what we'll do. How about we all say, you know, we think it should be Glacier. And the final move, his finishing move, will be the chronic kick. And so that's kind of we have we pitched it to Eric, and he kind of he kind of rolled it around, and he's like, "Okay, all right, we'll go with that." <laughs> so, but yeah, it was um, it was a long process of of um, going through just you know different names and different titles and different colors and all of that stuff, and just and, and Andre really you know forming the you know the armor and the helmet thing, even though the helmet thing was kind of short lived. But once again. This had never really been done before. This kind of time and effort, and money had never really been into put into finding the the athlete and then building the gimmick around the athlete. You know, now it's yep. pretty much pretty standard, especially with WWE and NXT and things like that. But um, uh, and not to say that we take credit for any of that, but I'm just saying though that's really how this happened. Is is you know the the people were found first, and then the the personas were created around the people. Absolutely. Yeah. So when they create Glacier, you finally, you know, you got the name, you guys got the look. Do you like just the the sense of like, okay, we're going to build them up and build them up as a surprise. Blood runs cold. Are you, are you loving that? Are you feeling that? Yeah. And, and I will tell you one thing. It's one of the things that I've learned over the years, um, because what I realized I, I was in the wrestling business nine years before I got my break, uh, yeah, almost right at nine years. And, um, what I realized when I, when, when, we worked as a group to create Mortis and Wrath and, and, and Glacier. And Ernest Miller was kind of earnest because he was already Ernest to Cap Miller. And he was always, right. he was already a three time world karate champ. We still had the mold of wrestling persona there, but it was a lot easier because he, he, you know, he, he was going to be based a lot off of what he brought to the table already, you know, in the real world. But, uh, um, but the one thing that I had to learn, cause I remember, I remember exactly where I was. I was at the power plant and I was going I was trying to figure out how does Glacier move in the ring? How does he, you know, who is Glacier? And I remember I was really frustrated. And uh, and, and Paige walks by and he says, uh, he's like, bro, like, what's wrong? And I said, I said, Paige, and this is early, early on, obviously. I said, uh, I, said I, I really, I have no idea who Glacier is. You know, I said, I don't really, I don't know who he's supposed to be, blah, blah, blah. Because once again, we weren't getting help from anybody else in the office, you know. And, um, and I remember him saying, he said, well, bro, you better figure it out because if you don't know who Glacier is, the audience certainly won't know who Glacier is. And yep. so, um, and so, and, and I do, um, I credit uh, Andre with this because uh, Andre, we sat down, me and all of us sat down and Andre said, look, let's do it exactly like, you know, they do with, with the character when they were sitting down to write a script. Like, what's the backstory of the character? Uh, we have to create these backstories. And so, and then that's when, and at that point in wrestling, I was borderline obsessive with wrestling. I really obsessed with it. I really was. And uh, I, it was just, you know, it was, I, I lived, ate, slept, breathed wrestling back then. I just, it was just, you know, the, and, and, and I, I know Canyon was the same way. So was um, uh, uh, 
Jim Mitchell. Uh, you know, Brian had already come off of a great run at WWF as Adam Baum. You know, I knew his commitment because we kind of came up uh, through the Georgia Indies together as well. And um, so um, I remember sitting down and once I had it in my head, OK, I have to create like who, and it's like I always tell our trainees, you have three options. You can go totally fiction. Everything can be, you can totally make everything up or you can pull from your real life. Or like what I did with Glacier is you can mold the two of those worlds together. Take some from each of one of those worlds and create who that person is. And so what um, what we did with with Glacier was, you know, Eric really loved the the, the family history I have in law enforcement. But uh, both my parents were career Georgia State Patrol. My twin brother was a, was a state trooper. My two uncles were in law enforcement. I mean, everybody but me, you know. And so uh, even though I, I have a cop haircut, look like I probably should have been a cop. But uh, um, and so. He really liked that. He wanted to play off of that. So we we created the whole story of me going to train, um, you know, in Japan, overseas. And I had this this old ancient kind of Mr. Miyagi type instructor, um, you know, and I remember, you know, us going to, uh, to and, 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 you know, son, uh, Sonny Ono was was good friends with Eric. He was already a part of WCW. And um, and they were saying, uh, I remember we asked his son, like, where where should Glacier be from? You know, and just one day he just said, oh, just from the Serenji Temple, Tokyo, Japan. You know, and, you know, I would find out later the Serenji Temple is not even in Tokyo, Japan. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, but, but nobody questions it. You know, it sounds yeah, valid. Of course. Go with yeah. it. And, uh, but, um, but yeah, so what, what we did was we um, we we combined all this, uh, the history of, of, of the law enforcement in my family and, and the uh, Japanese, you know, journey that was totally fiction and we brought those together and um and not not totally fiction i, mean, I wrestled with uwfi in japan for for a few years so so right. i had i had gone there i had trained there so it wasn't necessarily totally fiction it's just you know the, the you know as far as the old master and things like that we had added that element to it so so i'd, I'd stand corrected being that it was totally fiction but um but what we did uh eric you know if, if you look back at any of the original uh first several matches where i was on nitro you know eric talked a lot about that like you know like he uh, came from a family of law enforcement he had to make a decision was he going to go that route or was he going to go more of the martial arts world and, and maybe pursue a, a career competing in whatever world that was of course it would end up being pro wrestling so and i did i, com I competed in martial arts tournaments when i was younger i fought full contact karate uh when i was in college uh during the offseason of football so you know those those things were all true elements and so um and that's what I tell now with with all of our trainees and when I do seminars, because I, I, I always said, you really know who, you know, who you're if you have a gimmick name, do you know who that person is? And when I say, do you know who it is? Create your backstory. Like, you know, as far as that gimmick, like where like, you know, if, just say Glacier, like where is Glacier from? Uh, what What's Glacier's favorite color? What kind of vehicle does Glacier drive? Uh, does Glacier have siblings? Uh, if he has siblings, does he get along with those siblings? Right. You know, does, does he come from a single parent home or both or two parents, or maybe he was adopted? Like, who, who is this person? And the more you can answer those questions, like, does he drive a truck? Does he ride a motorcycle? If he rides a motorcycle, does does he ride a Harley or does he ride a you know a cross rocket? Like all those things. And once you know all those answers, then you start to know who who the, your persona is in the ring, and uh, and it's, it makes it cutting promos probably one of the hardest things in wrestling that people have to learn. But it makes cutting promos, you get a much clearer vision of what you're supposed to, your message can be in promos because of the fact that you know, you know, through and through who this person is. And um, yep. and I had to learn that because for the first nine years of wrestling, I thought I kind of understood that, but I never was really forced to do what I had to do with Glacier to really get very specific because they were going to have to tell the world who this person was, who's coming, came out of nowhere, you know, um, other than the vignettes that ran way too long, you know, <laughs> you know? So, but once again, they were figuring it out as they went. Uh, and so certain things, um, you know, went, went as, as according to plan. And, and, and I don't know if, if, uh, I was never really told for sure, like, you know, the vignettes that did run, you know, long, even, you know, Canyon and I were like, Oh man, like we're ready to get out there. Come on. You know, but it was one of those things, like I said, a lot of this was, was being done for the first time. So they were trying to figure out, okay, did we go a little bit further with that? Or did we pull the trigger and put him out there right now? So, so yeah, but um, yeah. And but I'll tell you this, I don't really regret any of it. Uh, the stuff that went right, maybe the stuff that didn't go as right as, as we wanted it to, because here's why, you know, I, I, I embrace all of it because of this, John is the fact that somebody had to do it first. Somebody had to do all that first. And there was always going to be things that were done right and things that maybe could have been done better. But there had, somebody had to be, be first. And we were, as far as I know, we were really that first kind of group that, that really was presented in that manner where all this time and money and, and you know, investment had been spent ahead of time. And, um, you know, and I, it was, it was, it was terrifying and exciting at the same time. <laughs> Incredibly stressful at times. 
Yep, yep. The thing is, it's okay. Blood runs cold. We don't know who it is. They're building it up with the you know the cool video packages, very Mortal Kombat esque. Even the music sounds a little bit like Mortal Kombat esque. Do you think that in essence, like uh, it's a little too close to Mortal Kombat, or is it a good thing? Yeah, well, you know, in, in pro-, pro wrestling, everybody knows pro wrestling feeds off what's popular in society, you know, yeah. typically. So, uh, of course, that was really popular. So, you know, uh, at this time, WCW offices were in, still in the CNN Center downtown. So, um, you know, I, I just have to believe that, you know, that there were conversations that were being thrown around was, hey, Mortal Kombat's popular. You know, we, 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 you know, we see that. We own a wrestling company. How can we make this? you know, make these merge these two worlds together, you know? And, um, but, uh, at, at the beginning, what happened, if, if you go back and you look, um, my look did change. Uh, there was a, a period where I got pulled off TV for about a, I don't know, maybe six, eight weeks, you know, but, uh, after I kind of really got some traction, but what happened was, uh, I remember Eric called me in his office and, uh, and he said, you know, that, um, the company that owned the rights to Mortal Kombat felt like it was a little confusingly similar. And mm-hmm. so, um, and, and I was so afraid that they were going to pull the plug on everything. So I was, I remember saying, you know, Eric and I have a conversation. Cause I remember Eric saying, you know, that, Hey, Ray, you know me, I love a good fight, but I, I don't know if we'll win this one. <laughs> and yep. so, and, um, but, uh, uh, but I remember saying, look, I, you know, the armor, the helmet, all that stuff is, is not sub zero. And so how about we just, the, but the, my ring tights looked a lot, it looks really similar to what Sub Zero looked like then, you know, with the blue and the black and 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 the yep. you know the front. And so I said, look, why don't we just, you know, before? I don't think pulling the plug was ever really specifically said, but that's what I felt like was about to happen. And um and I just said, why don't we do this? And and it was um once again, I was more of a group. We had all you know Andre and Chris and you know Kane. We all talked, and it was like, hey, let's just let's just you know pull Glacier off TV for just a little bit and let's change what he wears in the ring when he wrestles. Let's go more blue and silver. Let's go more royal blue than deep, deep blue. And let's take all the black out and let's try that. And we did. And thank God that seemed to to kind of ease the water some from that point on. Do you like that, you know, you're pumping it up, you're you're leading in. Like whenever they do vignettes, everyone's like, oh, who is it? Who is it? Is that almost a little bit too much pressure? Because there's some speculation. Is it Ultimate Warrior? You know what I mean? Is it like there's there's people are saying, oh, it's got to be some huge name, and you know what I mean, or like a a blast from the past? Like, is that to you a little bit of like pressure? It's like okay, you know, maybe don't build it up like it's a it's this guy from the WWF or something. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, it was, (laughs) it was, it was indescribable pressure. I I don't know if I've ever been able to put it into words Uh, because, but it also was. Let me just say this too: I was so blessed and fortunate to be among a group of the guys that became great friends. Ernest Miller is still one of my greatest friends to this day. And I just saw him earlier this week. And so, as they say, there's strength in numbers. So we were spending an awful lot of time together, me and Ernest and, and uh, Brian Clark and Chris Canyon and, and Jim Mitchell um, and Dallas. So we would actually, you will say that sometimes you're, you're so, afraid of and nervous of what may happen that you can't help but laugh. So when we would hear that somebody would say, Oh, it's, you know, the word is on the street that it's so-and-so we just laugh. We're like, man, you know, they're really going to be surprised when, when it's me that comes out, you know, yep. <laughs> but, but I remember Eric, you know, um, you know, being pretty clear about the fact that he wanted it to be someone that when people saw the, the you know, glacier, they didn't just see that it was some other name that had been repackaged. You know, and at that point, I had not been on a national level anywhere. Um, I had built a, a pretty darn good name in Japan with UWFI, but not not in the states. You know, I I, I wrestled mostly as a tag team. Um, you know, uh, when when and, I, and you know, I had a great, built a great reputation throughout the southeast, but I really didn't wrestle much outside the southeast those first nine years. So um, as far as me, you know, no one had really seen me. So when they saw Glacier. At least it was someone they had not seen before on a national level. So I really believe that did help. Um, I, I, Canyon and I, I mean, all of us, but especially me and Canyon, because Canyon had been had been in the wrestling business about the same time I had. His level of love for wrestling was borderline obsession like me. And he and I, one of the reasons we became such great friends is that I remember, like, we would, you know, working at the, we'd be at the power plant every day for, like, the first, gosh, I don't know. I mean, that first year, I mean, we were at the power plant, you know, literally, you know, every day it was open, you know, and which, which yep. is, you know, 
Um, and you had to earn your stripes in the power plant every day you went in. You, nothing was given to you. Every day you went back in, you had to, you started from scratch again. <laughs> but uh, but yep. but we, we I remember us having conversations so many times saying, like this is our break, man. This is this this is our opportunity. We cannot squander this. We have to be as ready as we can possibly be. And so we would go to the power plant. We would train. We would video it. Dallas was the guy who really started that whole ball rolling back in the day on video in your matches, you know? And so we, we invested in a video camera. We would video the stuff at uh, the power plant. We'd all go, we finish there around four o'clock. We go to the main event fitness. We train there. We all go home, get cleaned up, get something to eat. We'd usually meet at Canyon's ha- apartment at the time and watch what we had done that day in the ring. And uh, sometimes we meet at Dallas's house or whatever, but, um, but it was that kind of commitment day in, day out. I mean, and, and that's what, and what you know, and I didn't realize back then that we were necessarily, you know, that that work ethic was that, you know. And, and when I see people now who, who don't have that kind of work ethic and that kind of commitment to really trying to make it at a level where they're going to be making a living doing this, it gets very frustrating to me because I know, I know what I had to do, and and uh, and I, I I try so hard to never be that person. Oh, back when I was, you know, I don't want, I never want to be that person. But I can say right now, now that I'm on the other side of it, that that. I'm really, really proud, proud of how hard we worked and how serious we took that because it was, we, 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 we protected and guarded those personas. Um, and, and, and they meant a lot to us and we took it very personal with people didn't, you know, if they didn't, um, if they didn't appreciate what we, what we had done to really make those, those personas, you know, entertaining and believable and something that would captivate your attention for hopefully however long we'd be out there. And that's one main thing I do remember Eric saying in the very beginning is he said, I know these these guys are going to look like video game characters, he said, but I want everything to be played very straight in the ring. I don't want it to be funny. I don't want it to be silly. I don't want it to be campy. I don't want it to be comedic. I want these guys, when you guys go at it, I want you guys to go at it. I want I want you to kick each other. I want you – and unfortunately, you know, I mean, I, I have a great saying that's actually – with Pro Wrestling Tees right now, they came up with a T-shirt recently with me at uh, Glacier Canyon on the T-shirt. And, I, and, and um, uh, Julio, who I was working with, uh, you know, putting it together – um, he said, what do you think we should name the T-shirt? I said, well, there's a great saying that Ken and I had. We used to say good friends, better enemies, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, and um, and that was true. I mean, we went in there. We went hard. I mean, we went really hard and we weren't we, I mean, we were hitting and safe places. But, man, we were we were we tagged the, the, the crap out of each other because it was just one of those things where we kind of knew that's what Eric was kind of looking for a little bit and, and fair or not. And, 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 and like I said, we we kind of gl- gladly embraced it. But because we knew, too, like. The one thing that people are going to want to easily pick apart is, you know, how do they kick? How do they yep. chop? I mean, and and so we couldn't, you know, we had to really kind of go a little bit on the other other edge of that because uh, the one thing people were waiting to do is just pick that stuff apart. And and I was going to like, you know, you're not going to pick apart my kicks. You're not going to pick apart my leg sweeps. You're, you're not going to pick that stuff apart. Compared to what was going on in WCW when the NWO comes, very real. They're using the real names. They're tr- they're taking over the company. Everything is very real. Do you think that doing the Glacier, the cartoons? I know Bishop always says the buffet. Everybody, you yeah. get your different thing. But I know the kicks are legitimate. And it's like legitimate martial arts. But do you think that the characters itself, it's almost like too cartoony for what they were doing with the NWO, which was so like, this is real. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, I heard somebody say this, and it might have been might have been Eric that said this on one of his podcasts, but I think it, it, it kind of sums it up really good. Is in January of '96, the whole blood roll, blood runs, run, blood runs cold thing sounded like a really, really good thing. But yep. by the time of the fall of '96 and NWO had debuted, maybe not as as good as it, of an idea as it seemed in January of '96. So I get that, but no one no one knew, no one could predict that was going to happen, you know, and. Um, uh, and what I do say, one of the things I really am thankful to Eric and to WCW at that time is the fact that they um, they kept going with it. They kept us on board, and they kept saying, "You know, we're still gonna we're gonna we're gonna keep pushing this." So, um, yeah, I, and I'm always I'm always a big advocate of you know I feel like there should be a buffet as well. But uh, but let's face it, I mean, now we you look back now, I mean everything in WCW, and I mean literally everything took a backseat to the NWO. You know, I mean, that was what was driving the ship. And um, and it changed the, the, the face of wrestling uh, you know, forever, really, but especially during that period. Um, so our thing was, once again, I go back to let's concentrate on we can, what we can control. We go out there, we have to go out and we have to do the very best we can. And, and I will say one of the things that I'm really proud of is, you know, not once, not once. And I don't care what this 
like I said, there's critics that write all this stuff that there are certain things I think the stories like anything else that gain the snowball effect over the years, you know, like to say that the character, you know, or the, the persona was not popular with the fans and that people, you know, didn't like it or people thought it was silly, or whatever. Here's what I can tell you. And this is from the horse's mouth time. Not once, not once do I ever remember being booed when I was Glacier's a baby face, when I was Glacier's a heel, that's what yep. I wanted, you know, but, yep. um, but and not once do I remember the crowd chanting boring or anything like that. Uh, I take that back. One time I think we're in maybe somewhere like Cincinnati or Cleveland, but they were chanting boring for everything that night. <laughs> but um, but no, but I mean, you know, that's that's what I know from someone who lived it is that we went out there and we entertained the audiences. And I do think that I look at the, you know, I'm a big, and a lot of this I give credit to Paige because Paige is literally the most positive person I know. He really does walk that walk. And, and that was one of the things that he, you know, was telling us during that time. It's like, look, you know, find the positive, find the positive. Like everything else is so reality based. They're going out there and the NWO is the NWO and it's doing all this stuff. When you guys go out there, give them a little bit of a welcome relief, you know, for a little period of time from that. Give them something else that, that they can dive into and say, OK, this is different. And I can kind of set all that on the side and I can really enjoy this for what it is. And um, I'm glad we got the opportunity because, I mean, you know, we started in 96, the fall of 96. Um, and, uh, uh, and you know, I, I, we were on board. I mean, we were all there. You know, I was up there almost right up until the bitter end. Um, you know, I think my contract, my second contract ran out right around maybe January of 96. And then uh, I was um, at that time I was in discussions with them to come on board as a as a coach at the power plant, um, you know, because uh, Orndorff and I had become really great friends and and I had. Um, Orndorff really, really liked my commitment to wrestling, and um, and he liked the fact that I always was at the power plant, even when I didn't have to be. And um, uh, you know, and so uh, I was in talks with the office to, to kind of transition to more of a coach at that point, and then still make um, you know kind of appearances here and there as Glacier on TV or whatever, you know, where it was Saturday night or whatever. Yep. But um, so I, you know, I was I was there for that whole five year period, and as most of us were, you know, and uh, I mean, eventually, obviously, Ernest and, and Candy would leave to go to WWE, but uh, um, but. But I was there pretty much for that whole time, you know, and uh, but yeah, it's uh, so at the end of the day, I, I, the way I look at it is, is that um, that, yeah, you know, uh, did it go exactly the way that that for, that we planned for it to go? Of course not. But uh, most the overwhelming majority of people in the rest of the business, their careers don't go exactly how they expect them to go. Right? And yep. um, but the one thing I'm most proud of, John, seriously, um, is and I was just saying this, uh, it was either yesterday or the day before with our trainees. Is here's the thing I'm most proud of is the fact that one, that um, if if I, me or Canyon or whoever, if if we would have not been at that level where we could get in the ring and have the match with anybody on that roster and, and have a respectable match, then they would have found a way to get rid of us. And they kept us around. And I have to believe that I was very, very big. I still am very, very big on or presenting myself as a professional because I was very fortunate earlier in my career to get to know Lou Thez, uh from when I wrestled in Japan and, and, and Lou just imparted so much knowledge and wisdom upon, you know, to me as he did a lot of other people about, you know, take the role of being a professional wrestler really seriously and present yourself as a professional in every single way you can. And I did, you know, through my work ethic, through my, my, uh, my attitude, the way I, uh, I dressed everything. You know, when I did appearances, I gave everybody, the, I felt like I would try to get, I, I did give everybody the experience of like, you're the only person I'm meeting with while I'm here. You know I mean? I took all that stuff really, really serious. And I'd like to think that, you know, that Derek and WCW and they saw that. And, um, you know, so I was, I was obviously a valuable enough asset to keep around for that period of time. And, uh, you know, and I'm really, really proud of the fact that I can say I, I was, I was a part of, I was there during the greatest era, the biggest money-making era of wrestling ever. And the fact that I was a part of one of the greatest rosters of all time and earning my spot week in and week out, I earned my spot. Because back the way the contracts were written then for guys at my level, they could get rid of you at any time. They didn't have to give you a reason. They could just say, you know, right. you know you're know, you done. You can get, you know, after 90, you know, you got your 90 day not compete and you can go from there. You know? <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I, I made a good enough impression to, uh, to, to, to not get cut from the team, so to speak. And, uh, and that's something I'm really, really proud of, especially during that era. When you look at it, it's like, okay, you got the NWO, you know, they're dominating, uh, you know, 83 weeks of dominance, the Monday Night War. Like, how do you think Glacier ended up, like, where it started and it kind of 
where it ended. Like, did you think it was as good as it should have been? Because I mean, there were some great matches with Mortis and with Wrath, obviously, and with the Cat teaming up. I mean, there actually is. And it's funny to go back. Like, wow, it really holds up well some of the matches. But yeah. how do you think how you guys did as far as like during that that era and the NWO really just skyrocketing? Yeah, I feel like after you know I, my. Maybe my favorite match of my entire career was Bash at the Beach '97, and that's where we, you know, the 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 feud, so to speak, kind of came to a head, where Ernest and I tagged against Mortis and Wrath, and um, and we had just, you know, an unbelievably great match, you know, on all levels, you know, and um, but at that point, for whatever reason, it seemed like they didn't really know what to do with us, you know, the whole. Um, angle so to speak or, or or where to take it from there and even though we were and i, I just one of the things i pitch to anyone who's pursuing a wrestling and uh, a career in wrestling especially if you get to the point where you get a contract is do yourself a favor and be proactive constantly present ideas because anybody on the booking committee or creative team whatever you want to call it i mean they're so overwhelmed with trying to write tv every week that most of them that I know certainly welcome any ideas you can bring to the table. You know, it just makes their job a little bit easier. Whether they're good ideas or not, you'll, they'll let you know. But especially me and Canyon, me and Canyon would just constantly and 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 Vandy, you know, Jim Mitchell. Um, I mean, we would just constantly come up with ideas and and things that we could pitch. Just like, hey, how about do this with us? How about do this? How about this? How about this? How about this? You know, and uh, so we, you know, because we didn't want to just be sitting on the side. You know, and and then and, and then all of a sudden say, hey, we got to cut you loose because we don't have anything for you. And so we were all it was one of our goals to never, ever let them feel like they didn't have anything for us. But uh, that's one of my big um, this is one of the big questions that we it was just funny. I mean, it just seemed like it, with the match that we had, it was such a great match that um you know, Orndorff was our agent, and they put Orndorff with us for like the first year and a half, really, uh, just kind of like as our mentor, kind of. And I just remember how excited he was after that match. And this is freaking Paul Orndorff, you know? And so, um, and I felt like at that point, like, okay, like at least at the very least they're going to take this and we're going to, we're going to draw this out and get all the miles we can out of this, this angle now, you know, cause we finally had that big match where all four of us really went after each other, you know, on the pay-per-view and everything else. And they just didn't seem to, it just seemed to kind of stall right there for a while. And we all kind of four started to kind of go our, our different directions, you know? And, um, so that's a question I've never really gotten an answer to, but, uh, but I know we were pitching a lot of great ideas to him. Um, but once again, you know, I can't even imagine what it was like back then to be on booking committee and trying to write TV every week. I mean, the level of stress that, that those guys were going through, I I, I don't want to know what that was like. <laughs> so, but yeah. no, you know, for the most part, even when we kind of started to all kind of go more singles and stuff like that, like, like Ernest and I stayed together for quite a while. And, uh, you know, we had a run against, um, you know, Barb and Ming, and then you know a little bit against Harlem Heat, and then we came back to to Mortis and Wrath and stuff like that. We were always kind of a solid, good mid card. Would I like to have been higher? Of course, but once again, at that point, we were Ernest and I were kind of being looked at as more of a tag team. So uh, eventually, they decided to kind of split us off, as he did with kind of Canyon and and uh, Brian too. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it was uh, it just felt like they weren't really sure. They got it to a certain point, and then they weren't really sure where to go with it from there. And, um, but once again, you know, uh, I still felt like at the end of the day, if I can sit here and say, you know, that uh, I, I was a solid mid card, you know, wrestler on, on that roster week in and week out for, for the better part of five years, um, you know, that's still something to be very proud of. Did you mind when it came back and blood runs cold again and you're a heel, did, like kind of making fun of and poking fun a, a little bit of the glacier? Did you like that? Obviously, like you said, you did like getting booed, yeah. but like, as far as being playing the heel, did you like when they changed it and completely did a 180 with it? You know what? I'll, I'll tell you honestly, um, I actually loved it. I really loved it because, you know, it was one of those things where it was like, okay, you have your critics. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to lean into it. We're just going to lean into it and have some fun yeah. with it. And, um, and I will say one of the greatest things that came from my entire run in WCW was that part there where I got to work with Norman Smiley. You know, I would do the whole thing where I'd come up and try to try to get there to help save Norman. I would never really get there on time. Uh, Norman is is I mean, as most people know. If anybody's and, and, and Norman's been a um, you know has been a coach for the the WWE Performance Center for a long time now. Uh, you know, just just a stand up class act guy. And uh, and, and I'd, I'd kind of known him before that. And um, and we we don't we don't say we don't stay in touch, but we we cross paths every now and then because we were both in Orlando there. And and um, but uh, 
I really, really enjoyed just just doing anything where I was working with Norman, even though it was short lived. But you'd be amazed how many people when I wrestling fans I'll talk to that that's one of the main things they bring up is that little short lived part with me and uh, Norman. But um, no, Terry Taylor and, I, and, and Terry Taylor, who also is one of the one of the. Now he's one of the top guys, you know, people there at the Performance Center, and um, you know, legend, legendary wrestler in his own right. You know, uh, Terry um, helped me so much throughout different phases of my career, but especially during my time at WCW. And so, um, you know, there, there was a time when the booking committee changed, and um, I can't say that was the only reason, but there was a time when they kind of, uh, you know, um, pulled. Actually, what happened was I, I injured my knee in a match, and I had surgery, so I was on the table for a while. And then it, it was kind of the opportunity. Well, why don't we just kind of start phasing Glacier out, you know? And um, and that's when I, being proactive, spent money out of my own pocket and uh, had a buddy of mine who's the director come in from uh, down in South Florida, Miami area, and we actually wrote and shot and edited and uh, put together about eight or nine broadcast ready vignettes for the Buzz Stern gimmick. Yep. And so when I when they got ready to kind of let me go. I presented that to Eric. Eric liked it. And all of a sudden I was, you know, back on board again. And then I had to run with the bus turn thing. And then I was, and then the booking committee changed again. And it's somewhere through all that, you know, Russo and Ed Farrar showed up and, and were there for a while. And, and, um, and so then, you know, we were all, te- we were with that from almost a year. We did the bus turn thing, I think. And then um, I was in limbo a little bit. And then I'd start talking to Terry and, um, and we came, we, you know, he, but just in our talks, we kind of came up with the idea of, uh, and he always said, hey, hey, I would always love to see this guy just kind of, you know, lean into, you know, the fact that, okay, this is kind of a video game kind of character, you know, and and I'd, I'd been a uh, professionally trained actor at that point for quite a while. And if you remember back, one of the biggest things I was frustrated with back in the day was that they didn't let Glacier really cut promos. And, um, and I felt like I could. And so I never really got that chance. And with Buzz Stern, I think I got to show that with people that I, you know, I, I, I can be pretty entertaining when, when, if you just allow me to talk, you know? And so, um, uh, so what we did, John is actually, um, and, and, and this is, like I said, the, the very short version of it is, um, I went and I had some armor and a different kind of mask and just a little bit, you know, different look. So it wasn't exactly the same. And, um, and Terry Taylor and I kind of concocted this plan where uh, I believe it was Wednesdays. They would fly back up to TV on Tuesday from Saturday night tapings and have um, uh, the uh, booking committee meeting Wednesdays at the offices, WCW offices. So we, I had gotten all this new stuff made. No one really knew about it. And I remember Disco was on the uh, booking committee at that time, which says a lot right there. So <laughs> and I, I love Disco. He's a great friend of mine, you know, but, um, and so, uh, and Terry was there. And so Terry had brought in a, a boom box, you know, like back from the old eighties, nineties and had a cassette of my, uh, my entrance music in the cassette. And so I got there early. I met Terry early. And Terry instructed me what to do. I had put together this like minute long promo with this new persona of Glacier with this new attitude. And he believes that all, you know, that he's this superhero and, you know, whatever. And, um, and I actually, there was a closet in the boardroom area and I actually got, it went into the closet and closed the door and I had it just barely open and no one ever even thought to look in the check the closet. Why would they? I mean, there's no, so they all file into the, to the boardroom to get ready to start the booking meeting. Terry says, "Hey, wait a minute, guys. Is it? Would you guys hear something before we get started?" And he just hits play on the uh, on the boombox, and my interest music starts playing. I bust out the door, and I got this whole promo. I, I got him in the full new gimmick and everything. I cut the whole promo. I remember Disco starts laughing so hard he like rolls out of his chair. You know? And, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, great. And, and I go, I work my way around to the front door. I finish, and I finished with one strong statement and i literally shut the door and literally walked right through the the wcw offices with that stuff on go right up to my car i took it off to, you know to put it in the passenger seat got my car and drove home exactly what terry taylor, taylor told me to do and then he called me later that day and he's like hey they loved it you know we're gonna figure a way to work it back in so that's <laughs> so great the lesson is and i always teach to, to younger wrestlers aspiring wrestlers is that being proactive can literally you know, be the game changer for you as far as, you know, if you continue on with the company or not, you know, give them, you got to be able to invest in you, but uh, before maybe before they may invest in you. So I did that. I did that twice. Um, I did that with the bus turn. I paid out of my, I, we, we created the whole gimmick. I paid out of pocket to have my buddy come up and direct it, all that. It allowed me to keep my, my career with WCW. Then I did the same thing when we did the newer version of Glacier. But, um, but if I wouldn't have taken that chance and it, on me and invested in that, um, there's no way I could just go in and try to explain that. They might not have been able to see what I was trying to do. So I had to actually literally put it in front of them. And and twice, twice it worked. I do love that theme song. It is very catchy. Yeah. You know, I do <laughs> yeah. love that song. 
And it's funny too. You did a thing where like you were signing autographs, and your tag partner would go to like, and then yeah, you know, Shivani here would be like, he's out there signing autographs. <laughs> like he thinks he's this big star. He's not even helping his tag team yeah. partner. Yeah. And here's one of the things that a lot of people don't know, um, uh, and I'm sure you may know, Jimmy Hart. You know, Jimmy Hart's a great was a great musician. You know, oh, yeah. uh, with the Gentries back in like the '60s or whatever, they had a, a Keep On Dancing, which was a big hit for them. Um, and at that time, they had Jimmy producing a lot of the the, the entrance music for a lot of the, uh, the 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 wrestlers. And so, um, I had two different ring entrance uh, entrance music, uh, two different versions. But uh, but Jimmy produced both those. You know, which is kind of a nice really. Little, oh, yeah, I didn't Jimmy realize that. My my entrance music, yeah. And I'm still still great friends with Jimmy. Uh, you know, and anybody's ever met him, you know, Jimmy's one of the nicest guys in our industry. Such a I don't know catchy song, but he obviously he knows what he's doing with those catchy songs. He's been oh, doing yeah, it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And it's, it was always pretty cool just to think that Jimmy Jimmy produced it, you know. <laughs> and he, you know, he knows what he's doing even WWF wise when he put yeah, some of those songs yeah. in WCW. I mean, other oh, yeah, songs. Yeah, some of the ones that literally have gone down in history, you know, as those yep. catchy tunes that he came up with. Yeah. So as we wind it down, we, we head towards the finish here. When WCW is gone, dead, you know, dead and buried, it, it's over, Vince buys it, is that sho- like shocking to you at that point? Because to me, it's as a fan, it's like, oh, my God, Vince bought WCW. And as, as the jokes online now or go, he bought it for so cheap that he paid all the women that he had these uh, affairs with. He paid them more money to be quiet than he paid for WCW. But were you surprised? <laughs> you know, funny thing, I hadn't heard that yet, but that's great. And it's, yeah. Oh, uh, oh, yeah. That's all over. Yeah, yeah that's all over. That. Oh, yeah, that's great. It's yeah. actually they were saying three times more that he paid for the women that he paid for WCW. <laughs> that's funny. That's kind of like when I, I watched a um, documentary on the death of SMU football back in the day. You know, and Eric Dickerson was you know the star running back. But they oh, talked yeah. about how many the players were paid back then, and they talked about when Eric Dickerson got drafted to the NFL. Well, he actually took a pay cut, you know. <laughs> He's making so much money, by the, the yeah, person, yeah. So. But yep. um, but no, yeah. Um, here's the funny thing, John, is that I remember pretty much exactly where I was when I when I got the uh, the message that we had been, you know, that the company had been uh, bought out. I don't. I, I just think in the beginning, I think all I knew was it was it was bought out by, and it probably I didn't know it, you know. It was WWF or, or excuse me, WWE at the time. But, um, uh, but I remember, I remember pulling over and this is a weird thing that, uh, but I, it just, it stuck with me all these years. I remember pulling over and literally taking like this deep breath, like, and it literally was like, like a million pounds had been lifted off my shoulders. And it took me a while to really consciously understand what was going on. But what it was, was that back then, and it's still this way now, um, uh, as far as I think most of the, maybe not so much in AEW, but I, I think in the, in WWE, it's probably the same way. It was, you know, most contract, you have your contract, but you know, you're an independent contractor and they usually have these 90 day clauses built in that they can reevaluate you every 90 days and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, at that time, and this is not, I'm not saying this was necessarily um, anybody, you know, purposely made people feel this way, but because you always knew that literally you could get let go at any time, it, it really, you know, most of the contracts, as you know, my agent would say, they're not worth the paper they're printed on. You know? right, it's, right, uh, yep. But is that um, there was this pressure, like always walking on eggshells, like, man, if I, if you know, uh, and there's a kind of an old saying in the rest of business, it's a one strike business, you know, that, you know, you could, you know, just, you know, tick off the wrong person and, and you know, fair or not, you could be gone, you know. So there was this pressure that I didn't realize I was living under for, for those five years that, uh that as soon as I knew I couldn't be fired, like that, you know, the, 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 as far as the run, the ride with WCW was now definitely over, not just for me, but everybody who was there, it was over. Like I was without a job at that point, you know? And, uh, but yeah. And so, but it was, it was crazy. It was like this, this almost like relief to a certain extent, like all that pressure is now gone, you know? Now, granted, yeah, it was immediately followed by the pressure of, all right, how am I going to pay my mortgage? Yeah, get a job. Yep. yep. <laughs> so, but, uh, but you know, it was crazy because I, I didn't really consciously realize, even though we, we, we talk about it from time to time, but, you know, it's just, I just, man, I mean, that moment, it, it just kind of went away. And I was like, like, wow, man, you know, I, you know but my blood pressure is kind of probably going to go down a little bit. <laughs> yeah. No, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, it was, um, and, you know, and, and uh, maybe we, you know, when we maybe hopefully I can maybe come back on uh, sometime in the future and I can I can talk about the fact that, you know, I was really proud of the fact that I did get offered a um, uh, I did get offered a, a, a very modest offer by WWE at the time. To, to, right. Because um, uh, 
someone in the office, you know, picked up on the, the law enforcement thing and, and they um, they wanted they thought it'd be a great idea to bring me in to do a state state trooper type gimmick. And um, I thought about it for a little bit. And once again, I mean, it's, you know, they weren't making big offers in because they didn't have to because they were the only show Game in town, town, you know. Yep. And so um, and uh, but, you know, I just um, I actually consulted with uh, with Dusty on it and and some other people I trusted. And I just I felt that was a little too close to home for me, you know, to 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 put my family's legacy out there, um, you know, because uh, to them, it would have been just a gimmick. To me, it would have been a lot more personal. And and, and I just I didn't want to risk that. And honestly, and the, and the, the bigger reason, the much bigger reason was the fact that um, one, I just I got engaged at that time. So I was looking to get married um, and I really kind of yearned for more of a normal life. You know, even if it's just for a while, you know, because that five years was, you know, it was a crazy life. And um, and then I, I had this opportunity. If I had this normal life, I could be working with Dusty as much as possible, you know, to help him build Turnbuckle. And uh, and that really, really, you know, was resonated with me. So thank God my, my buddy Steve Day offered me a, a teaching position. And um, uh, and, uh, and and I, I went back to teaching that fall right there in Marietta and, and, and work with Dusty to help build TCW. And, and, uh, and I don't regret that for one minute ever. Well, I mean, would it have been nice to have a, a run in both companies? Of course. I think that's back then. I think that was pretty much everybody's goal was, Hey, have a good run in both, both companies and don't burn bridges. So maybe you could jump back and forth, you know, and then eventually one went away and, you know, everything kind of changed, but, but yeah, so that, that's really kind of, um, uh, where I was, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was, uh, uh, I have very, very few regrets about um my whole wrestling career as a whole but especially my time at wcw i mean i i met some great people had some great experiences wrestled in arenas i never even thought i'd set foot in you know and um so yeah it's 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 been a great ride and uh you know i i, I and i still love being glacier when i go out and do appearances everywhere i mean uh in this light i don't look like my, i don't like my hair's too thick in this light but actually you know i can still throw some hair color on the hair and keep it from looking too gray and uh um, thank God I look somewhat like I did when I was in the, you know, the armor still somewhat fit. So I can still do appearances and still be glacier and, and hopefully just, um, you know, bring back some good memories for people of a time when wrestling was, was the hottest it had ever been. And I was, you know, I was very fortunate to be able to, to be on that rocket ship. It's pretty cool. You still got the stuff. Cause I've seen it at yeah. the shows and stuff you still got. It. And they I put up the, the, the nitro stuff. set and stuff. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And you know, what's funny is, uh, cause people ask me like, well, like, did you have to campaign for that? The truth is, <laughs> Honestly, is but nobody ever asked for it back, so I just kept it. You know, nice. <laughs> so, you know, hey, if so they I don't ask, you don't need to return it. Yeah, you know, and, I'm, and I'm very thankful, and I, I'd like to think that um, maybe whoever was was out there, um, uh, you know, was uh, uh, and maybe it was just understood that hey, this was all because uh, what would they do with it if it wasn't me wearing it? I don't know what it would have probably collected dust in some you know right. warehouse somewhere. But um, uh, I'm glad. I'm, I'm very fortunate. I'm very thankful to WCW that I was allowed to, to keep it. And I feel like I've, um, I've worked very hard to, to, to preserve the, uh, the persona of, of Glacier. And, and, uh, and it's really cool to, to go to co conventions now and, and, and meet people who are maybe in their, you know, say, you know, mid to late thirties, early forties, who were kids then who have their own kids now. And, you know, to be able to come up and, and, you know, have that experience with them. Um, and I always say I'm a fan first. Uh, I mean, I love professional wrestling. Uh, when I still, still sit down to watch wrestling, I really do try to turn off the uh, professional wrestler brain, part of my brain. So I can just watch as a fan. I mean, that's hard sometimes, but I really do because, because I just have a, a love for this business uh, as a fan. And, uh, and so when I go do appearances and, and, and uh, conventions and things like that, like, you know, I, I do my appearance and then I try to spend some time walking around and just enjoying the atmosphere, too, because it reminds me of why I fell in love with the business, you know, and, and why I made such a commitment to it. And and hopefully I can leave a really good mark. You know, I, I'd like to think that I can be in the, connected to the rest of the business until I take my last breath, which hopefully will be, you know, I'll be here for, for quite a while longer. And uh, but I do. I mean, I love this business. I um, I love being able to be connected with Cody and QT with the nightmare factory um, and being a coach here and, uh, and, and hopefully molding a little bit of the next generation and um, you know, putting them on the right path. 
Now, I know you don't want to get too much into it because there's going to be more details coming a little bit down the road, but I know you've been working on some movies lately. Some yeah, films. yeah, yeah. And you and I, of course, we talked about it before we uh, before we came on the air. Um, we, uh, uh, my, with my co-producing partner, uh, Luther Biggs, who once again was my protege when we did the bus turn uh, angle back in the day. Uh, and we met at the power plant back in 96, we became fast friends. <clears throat> and he's, um, he's like family to me now. We're, 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 you know, like, you know, we're like two, uh, you know, two brothers, you know, we, we get along most of the time. We butt heads sometimes, you know, <laughs> yep. but, uh, but we, uh, we got together years ago. And one of the things that, that really aggravated us was the fact that there has never really been a pro wrestling movie that really celebrates everything that's great about professional wrestling and uh, mainly the camaraderie that comes from any group of people getting together and pursuing a dream that they, that's a like-minded dream. And, um, and the people in the wrestling business, the men and women that get in wrestling, uh, I'd like to think that that's, that's been my experience is that um, the, the people I've met uh, loved it like I loved it. And so, um, and, and so we, but all the movies that we had seen about pro wrestling either showed the dark side of the business, which I totally understand, or it was kind of a campy movie that kind of made fun of wrestling or whatever. And, um, and, uh, you know, we just decided we're like, you know, we, there needs to be a movie that celebrates wrestling, a good family friendly movie that the whole family can enjoy. Uh, and so what we did was we went out and, uh, and and like I said, I'd love to be able to come back maybe after the first year when we get really yeah. full uh, promotional mode for the film is uh, is to promote it. We're in post production now. Uh, but the film is, is an ensemble cast film with a, a ton of legendary pro wrestlers. And um, it's basically uh, the Magnificent Seven meets They Live, John Carpenter's sci-fi film that starred Roddy Piper. And uh, so if you can imagine pro wrestlers battling aliens um, in kind of a classic old Western style, that's what the movie is. Um, it's uh, uh, There's a lot of pro wrestling in the movie because that's we know that's our audience. Um, but we have that sci-fi element too because I know a lot of pro wrestling fans are sci-fi fans too and vice versa. But um, but yeah, it's a movie with uh, uh, stars myself, um, uh, my buddy Luther, Ernest Miller, Ernest Cat Miller, um, and some, some great Hall of Fame wrestlers, the living legend Larry Zabisco, King Haku, um, Diamond Dallas Page, Stan, uh, the Larry Hansen, Gangrel, uh, and uh, there's a world world heavyweight boxing champion Pinklin Thomas makes a cameo in the movie. Um, uh, it, it's just and uh, and it's uh, there's a lot of really great actors in the movie that uh, people recognize. Great character actors. Uh, the uh, gentleman who plays the, uh, the kind of uh, shady promoter is uh, Adam Minarovich, who's uh, uh, if you're a fan of The Walking Dead, you know you remember Adam Minarovich. He played Carol's abusive husband in season one, and um, and a lot of other really really great actors and and wrestlers. There's a like I said, there's a lot of action in the movie. Um, there's things that most people aren't going to expect from the movie. There's uh, there's gunfire and explosions at the end of the movie. So. So, um, uh, cause like I said, we end up kind of, uh, the story is we, we all come together to, for this cause to go back on this wrestling tour for this promoter. We all swore we'd never work for again. And, um, and then along the way we stop off in this North Florida town that's been taken over by aliens and we end up standing with the town to take back the town. And, uh, it's a really fun movie that the whole family can enjoy. Um, there's a lot of, uh, uh as I always call it, 18, 18 style action, you know, and, yep. and there was some gunfire and there's nobody's head getting blown off. It's people maybe getting shot in the arm or the leg or stuff like that. But, um, but it's a really, it's a really fun movie, but it's also a movie with a lot of heart that I don't think people are going to expect. And, uh, I think what's really going to be surprising John to a lot of people is how well, all the pro wrestlers did in the film as far as their acting uh, presence. I mean, it, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a fun film. It's called the unbreakable bunch. And uh, we just put up a um, Facebook page for it. It's an unbreakable bunch movie. And um, you can see who all's in the movie. We've got a bunch of behind the scenes pictures. Uh, like I said, we're in post-production now. Very exciting time for us. We're, um, we're hoping, <clears throat> planning and hoping on getting a, um, at least a limited theatrical release for the film, doing a lot of promotions for the film. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, like yours here, wrestling podcast that uh, uh, I think I'm going to be taking a lot of throat lozenges and, 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 and trying to hit as many of them as I can to talk about the film because it's something that um, I hope I can leave a legacy with this film. Uh, uh, Luther and I both do, and, and everyone that's in it that's from the wrestling business to, to leave a film that's um, uh, something that hopefully people will enjoy for years and years and a movie that, uh, you know, that if you throw it in, uh, if you watch it on one of the streaming networks or in a theater or something, you just know you're going to, it's for a good hour and a half, you're going to have a, a good fun, fun time and enjoy a movie that really uh, makes you feel good about being a pro wrestling fan. Now, where can everybody find you as far as social media and otherwise? Um, you know, just at Glacier Ray Lloyd is, is what I'm on Facebook and Instagram and uh, at uh, on Twitter. It's at, at I am Glacier, and uh, and I haven't been real active on Twitter. I'm getting ready to fire that back up, uh, mainly to help kind of promote the film. But but yeah, uh, so I, I'm out there and. Uh, 
Um, and like I said, too, I mean, you know, I, I, uh, with the, the Nightmare Factory as a coach. So um, uh, and hopefully, um, you know, as far as our, our we're going to be continuing on with our camps and, and everything. So uh, uh, we just want to hopefully get as many people out there uh, earning their stripes and, and building the brand, as I, as I like to say, that we can and, uh, and contribute to what's good about wrestling. Because because uh, there's a lot of really good about this industry. Well, Mr. Lloyd, thank you so much for all the time. Blood runs cold again here on the Two yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate it all the time. Hey, thank you, John. I really appreciate it, buddy.